welcome to a new episode of Outside the Panels with your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes. Welcome everyone to another episode of Outside the Panels. As the intro says, I am your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes. My hair is a lot less purple and a lot longer. It's a lockdown for you, what you're going to do. Uh, joining me for this episode is a writer who I first came across a couple of years ago and a couple of indie books that practically blew me away. Um, he's back with a new Kickstarter team to talk about it. Let me introduce you to Doug Wagner. Doug, how's it going? You're doing great, Johnny. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you so much for asking and taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, yes, the book's in question. I've got to say, plastic. Yes. Man, that was bonkers. Uh, in a good way. In a good way. Yes. And, and the ride, uh, Burning Desire. I'd, I review comics for Comic Crusaders, and I'd, I'd read the first issue of the ride, and I thought, yeah, it was good. Gave a great review, gave it loads of stars, because it was fantastic. And then somewhere along the line, I missed out on the rest of it, so I was lucky enough to catch up on the trade. And man, what a blast that book is. Oh yeah, I had a buy. Um, both those books are were, were a ton of fun to put together. And obviously the teams that I'm working with on those, both Daniel Hilliard's doing the main story in the ride and in plastic. He's incredible to work with. Just a you know, just an absolute joy to to put books and stories together with. Excellent. So we're gonna talk a little bit in a while about you, me, your Kickstarter that's kick, that's going on at the moment. Doing very well, I have to say. Yes. Very, very, very well. Um before we get there, we're going to start at the top and work our way down. Okay. Look, how did you get into comic books? Oh, as a kid. I mean, for me, it was, you know, I, you know I'm going to age myself here. Um, it was a spinner rack at 7-Eleven. All right. Okay, yeah. Cool. I mean, you know, it was, it was, I was a young kid, probably about five, and I started out with what you would, you know, you would expect at that age, like Casper, Hot Stuff, the Flintstones. Ah, the Flintstones. Um, oh, yeah. I loved it. You know, uh, and, you know, as I, as I got older, I kind of started getting a little bit more attracted to stuff like, you know, I started seeing the, the superhero books. And so I kind of jumped into like, I think my first one was Fantastic Four, back when Doctor Doom and Silver Surfer were both in it. And that kind of hooked right. me. Okay, cool. And then it was just to grow from there, man. I mean, it's like I didn't discover comic shops until I was 17. I didn't even know they existed. <laughs> so I was one of those guys that was like running into every grocery store and every convenience store going, where's the next issue? Where's the next issue? You know, trying to find it on the stands. That, that, that was me. That was me yeah, back yeah. in the 70s with the British circulation was terrible. So you'd, I would buy books like Brave and the Bold because yes. in the Brave and the Bold, you got one story per issue. You didn't have to worry about catching the next one. Oh, there was a rare treat if you got two issues consecutively. <laughs> rare tree so how did you break into the industry how did you go from being that that super super fan of, of the comics and the superheroes and how did you get into to writing your own stuff yeah i mean initially i mean yeah as an, as you imagine like in the in the 90s like most of it was all my energy was focused on marvel and dc uh -huh. um kelly hammer who i was friends with in, in high school he, he had already broken in and we were kind of like trying to work together to, to figure out how to get me in there and uh, he started working for malibu comics all right. And Hank and Alts, yeah, Hank and Alts yeah, was yeah. the editor at the time, and he hired me to do some Ultra Force issues. So that was kind of like my first break in. Uh -huh. As everybody knows, then Marvel bought Malibu and shut it down. So that kind of like killed that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then it was retribution for the image thing. That's what that was. Oh, yeah, exactly. You took our uh, guys. We're going to take your company. <laughs> we're going we're to take your coloring system. You know, that's <laughs> what it ended up being. Um, and then uh and then it took a couple more years and then basically i jumped in with the first issue of the ride way back in i think 2004 and that was just one of those things where me and a friend sat down and said you know we're tired of talking about doing comics let's just do them mm -hmm. and uh during that whole you know during the past you know 20 years you know it's been me kind of like doing some stuff for dc custom and also really doing a lot of like you said my creator own work which is you know that's what i prefer because I, I really like working close with the team like I like working with the colorist and the letterer and the, and everybody involved. Yeah. And the downside to like the typical Marvel DC method for me is all I ever dealt with was the editor. Yeah. And that, that's got its rewards, but I really love working closely with my team and, and trying to figure out how we can kind of push the boundaries of what we normally do. Cool. See, I, I speak to a lot of writers. Uh, we've interviewed a fair few on the show and I always get the impression, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, so please correct <laughs> me. I always get the impression that writers, 
especially on indie books and their own create their own books tend to be mini editors in themselves is that, oh, yeah. is that a fair assessment yeah, that's a, that's a fair assessment. You're also the de facto like manager and, and group counselor. <laughs> you, know, it's like, you know, it's like everything that's kind of going on with the book, whether it's with Image or Dark Horse or whoever you're working with, like you're kind of like the go-to man. Everybody, you know, Dark Horse calls you when there's problems. The yeah, creators yeah. call you when there's problems. And you're kind of like the middleman the whole time in the middle of it too. So yeah, yeah you are. <laughs> They're like, Doug, there's no way you're getting a helicopter crashing into the building again. We're not doing yeah, it again. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dark horse on the phone saying, I want more helicopters. Uh, <laughs> all right, okay, so I need to talk a little bit about plastic. Okay, let's do it. Where did that come from? I mean, the whole the whole guy and his uh, girlfriend. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to spoil it for anybody who's not read it. Go read the book. That's what, go read the book, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, man, that's... I started reading it. I was like, what? I mean, there's shades of Clayface in there a little bit, I suppose. Clayface 3. But you kind of, after that, it's like, it's, it's, it's a love story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a love story with a serial killer. You know, so like, it's, yeah. It's, <laughs> so it's, I mean, the fun st story behind that was like, I was actually, um, one year at Baltimore Comic Con. Brian Stelfreeze and Eric Layton and I decided we were going to drive up there and set a flight there. That's when I lived in Atlanta. Uh -huh. And uh, we just figured out shipping the booth was going to cost too much money. So we were going to run a minivan and drive up there. Uh -huh. And during that 16 hour trip, which was surreal in itself, plastic came to me. And it, you'll, you'll understand why when I tell you like the, the mini story behind it, we're driving, you know, we're all tired because we'd gotten up at like four o'clock in the morning. So, you know, you're a little bit delusional too. And uh, we passed the sign, the welcome sign for Virginia. And instead of it being a welcome sign, all it says is buckle up Virginia. <laughs> and as you know that just happens to be the last line of plastic so <laughs> <laughs> excellent excellent yeah. so little snippets that are, that are really like um so you started the work on on the ride in 2004 you say yeah correct mm -hmm. so how long does it take then from for like an independent typewriter who kind of has their own book their own idea what they want to get out there how's it how long does it take to get that from inception at the idea of the inception to get that book out? Because I'm, I'm assuming you've got to speak to lots of different publishers to kind of, you know, find the fit. And to be honest, I think plastic and the ride, you know, you, you, you looked out with, with, with the, with the guys you went with, cause there's a whole, oh, bunch yeah. of, whole bunch of publishers that probably wouldn't have touched, especially plastic more than the ride. Oh, yeah. But, um, you know, it's, it, it, how, how does that go about? How long, how long does that kind of take? Because it would frustrate me if I had this book and it was ready to go and I had to go to Dark Horse. No, go to, no, go to, D, no, DC ones or shit. Go to, you know, it, it, it would just really, you know, how does that kind it, of work? Early in the, earlier, earlier in my career, that's true. Like there was this whole anxiety of like, where am I going to find a publisher? Where am I going to find a publisher? I probably don't do things the smart way. I, like Daniel and I just started doing the book. We just, we were three issues in before we ever pitched it to a publisher. And it, now I have the mindset of like, do I believe enough in this idea that I'm going to do it no matter what? Mm -hmm. And so I put the team together, we start working on the book. And when I get to a point where I think it's ready to publish, I go and start seeing if somebody wants to publish it. I know that's kind of like a backwards way of doing no, it, but no, like. I, I like it. it yeah. One of the things I always, we always talk about on, on a couple of other shows is especially with with big two books especially dc yes i'm looking at you dc <laughs> <laughs> when they bring out these massive ideas of i don't know i'll pick one doomsday clock and mm -hmm. then you know it's supposed to be 12 issues it ships monthly then it ships bi-monthly then it ships well you're lucky if you get one every three months then people forget about it and then four years later the thing's finished it's like when I hear somebody say, "Right, we're going to do, we're going to do a chunk of the book first, <laughs> then we're going to publish it," it's kind of it makes sense to me because you know you want something to say. Right, there you go, slip that in your schedule, you know, and that will give you time for the lead-in. So you've got three month lead-in already from the previews world type thing. You've already got three books, so then you've got yourself, you've bought yourself practically nine months worth of time to right. finish the, finish the book off before it, you know. So it makes comment, it makes perfect sense to me. I don't understand. 
I don't understand how books ship late. I don't know who's on. Well, I mean, I, and I've run into, like, Brian Stelfreeze and I were working on Gun Candy, you know, kind of like the follow-up to the original ride. And he, he had finished up the first issue and then broke his hand after we'd already solicited the second issue. So, you know, obviously it's going to yeah. be like that kind of thing. Yeah. But what that put that in my head was I want to make sure this doesn't happen again because I hate when my book ship late. You know, because I, I feel responsible. So yeah. that's why, like, I'm always, like, way ahead on, you know, before we even, like, pitch the book. I'm, like, many issues in before yeah. I even consider letting that's them solicit shout. it. It's yeah. a good shout. Absolute good shout. I, I applaud that. Absolutely. As a fan of books, whether they be Marvel, DC, or, or create your own stuff, nothing worse than, than a, a schedule that just is just wonky, you know? Mm -hmm. I totally get that. Okay, so... Um, you've, you mentioned Brian Stelfreeze. I absolutely yes. love some of his work. Some of his, I mean, his painted covers for the Shadow of the Bat. Uh, oh yeah, book back in the nineties. Um, yeah, I've got my old old timers comic book show head on. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm talking about nineties comic, but you know, my God. <laughs> we'll come up to date soon. Don't worry. Um, so I mean, that that works gorgeous. Painted work. I mean, how do you manage to sort of like? Do you kind of give him the like when you work with him? Do you give him the idea, or do you just say, "Look, this is kind of what I want." He just goes away and then blows your socks off. How's that? Well, with most of the people I work with, including Brian, like I work really close with them, so it's it's a weird process of like me pitching them an idea or them pitching me an idea, and then we kind of like slowly build on it together. Um, and it's usually like a, a little bit more like one upsmanship, you know. So like I'll be like, <laughs> "Hey, you know, going back with you, what if we crash a helicopter into a building?" Huh. And then, you know, then Brian's like, well, what if we crash a helicopter into a spaceship? And I'm like, well, what if we crash a spaceship into the moon? You know, and so, like, that's kind of like the energy we work with, okay, you know, cool. and so it's like this really, like, back and forth collaboration with everybody that I work with that I, I just absolutely adore. I just wanted to know that crashing a helicopter into the building was my idea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just so everyone hears that, right? That was your idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 So when that appears in the next comic book. I'll make sure. You'll be the pilot. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> this deal has just gone south. Now I know how Randall <laughs> Carlisian <Kalishin> felt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, cool. Excellent. Let's talk about your Kickstarter. Let yes. me get this up on the screen. So the Kickstarter address is there. It will be running through the rest of the pod, uh, so go and check it out. We are going to show you a little bit because... We are um, super, well, I like it. I've read it. I thought it was great. So let me just bring up this. Um, we'll go with, uh, there you go. Oh, How yeah. How's that look? The lowest cover. Yeah. Gosh, check it's that. so good. Yeah. So this is Yumi, the spy fatale of Baddy Royale. Excellent. Talk to us about Yumi. What's the, what's the, what's the story behind this book then? So Yumi is in love with Richard. Richard just happens to be British intelligence's top double O agent. Might sound a little familiar there, so you know where our foundation is coming from. <laughs> there are, there are. To be fair, there's lots of different foundations in this book. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah you're true. Like that, that is true. Yeah. Cool. Um, Richard, Richard ends up disappearing, and Yumi's not going to wait to find out what happened to him. So she is going to burn down every intelligence agency, every megalomaniac, and especially every ex-girlfriend in order to find him. So she goes on a tirade around the world trying to find where Richard's at. And uh, what, what you find real quickly is she might be the world's greatest anti-spy. Like she's a genius level hacker. She's like basically a ninja. And uh, you know, so you're talking about katanas and kunai. And of course, you know, can't leave out the fact that we have a sentient Lamborghini in the mix. Well, you know, I was I was going to throw the Knight Rider in there. I was. Yeah. It's kind of like, Michael, they're getting away. <laughs> yeah, except ours is based on Cardi B. So there's a little bit of different, you know. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I can't impersonate Cardi B. Sorry, Me either. <laughs> so that, 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 I'm out on that. I, that's as good as I get for Kit. And I know that, you know, he's not even the British, but hey-ho. Um, all right. So you said the anti-spy. It's really fun because this book is chaos personified i don't think i don't think looking through this book there's just one quiet panel in fact probably the cover is the only quiet <laughs> panel in the whole book and, and honestly that was kind of like an intention we kind of wanted to play yumi as like a younger character who's kind of like really into the you know snapchat tiktok kind of generation 
uh-huh. kind of thing and a little bit on the ADHD side. So we kind of wanted to keep that speed of like her speed of thought, like she's thinking faster than everybody. Yeah. So we kind of wanted the book to kind of feel that way as well. Cool. So you kind of, you get the idea that there's different covers for, for the book. My, I personally, I think this one's my favorite shades of Joel Jones on this. Yeah. That's um, Chris Bruner. Who's absolutely amazing. Um, and I absolutely love the uh, Marilyn Monroe homage at the bottom. But oh, yeah. So that says more about me than it does about the book. So, you know. <laughs> so, That's <yeah>. fair. <laughs> um, all right, so here we go. So this is the kind of the art style we've got. Uh, the artist you worked with on this book was Hoyt Silver, is that right? That is correct. Cool. Um, great guy. He's actually a, a, was an intern. That's not the right word. He was an apprentice to Brian Stelfreeze for years. So you can okay. kind of see the influences there from yeah. Brian. Now you've said that, the, the angular elements do definitely have that sort of like, yeah, totally see that, yeah. It's cool. Excellent. Ooh, lots of music playing. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so we said there's different influences on here, all right? So influences uh, being, I, I mentioned Knight Rider because you mentioned mm -hmm. the talking car, all right? Right. Here a talking car, it's Knight Rider, yeah, no matter what age group you are. And yes... <laughs> Yes, I know it's a Mustang, and yes, I know it's a Trans Am. So, you know, I am up to date. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so what other influences are in there? Uh, to, to be Bond honest with you, like, yeah, James Bond, obviously, Ian, I mean, Ian Fleming was, you know, the basis for the, the whole idea to begin with. We kind of want to just take James Bond and flip it on its ear a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. But then, honestly, like, when Hoyt and I were talking, we wanted to throw in pieces from all of our favorite movies. So, you know, if, if you're paying attention, there's callbacks to the Matrix and the Fifth Element, um, Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Uh, obviously, you know, I mean, I started writing it before the Kingsman came out, but Kingsman obviously has some of the same flavor as yeah. this. Yeah. Yes, I, I can see that. And and some of the, you know, the, the shout outs to the different, I think Commando's in there. Is Commando in yeah. there? Oh, yeah, Commando's in there, yeah. And now um, for some, I had to throw in Yojimbo just because if any chance I get to throw in some you know, old samurai movies, I have to throw them in there. <laughs> it makes sense. Um, so it, it's funny because you've got this really angular style for the majority of it. You know, So we've got this kind of the, the style that we just had there. Um, there it is again. We'll just go through it. Um, and I'm not giving away the plot. I'm not going, well, I'm not going through all the pages. You want to find out about the book, go check the Kickstarter. That's what it's there for. Um, th there's a lot of this angular style in there from uh, from Hoyt, but there's also a more, um, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to pronounce the word, but it's a chubby, chubby style. Oh, yeah, chubby an anime manga style. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I never know. You know, my mutant power is to say things wrong. I, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm lucky I can say Doug Wagner and I'm all right, you know? So, um, so, <laughs> so is that, is that the different, the different style? Is that Hoyt as well? Sort of like oh, yeah. Both, yeah. Yeah. Both of them are Hoyt. And, and Hoyt and I, when we first started the book, we knew we were going to have some flashbacks in there because we wanted to kind of show you like Yumi and Richard and how they, their relationship initially developed. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wanted to do something different because I always like when you look through a book and you can tell just by looking at it that we're in a different time period or we're in a different, you know, part of history. Yeah. And so that's where Hoyt came up with like, hey, I think I really want to try something radical here. And, uh, you know, the great thing about indie books is you can go, let's go radical. You know, like, let's just throw it all to the wind and try it. Yes, definitely. There is that element where you can just do it's it, It's I don't want to say balls to the wall, but it pretty much is. And this, oh, yeah. this this book pretty much encapsulates that. I think there's that there's that chaos factor that's just in full flare, in full force. I've got to say though, um, pacing wise, how did you find trying to to deal with the kind of the chaotic action scenes versus some of the more conversational or expositional type things because sometimes that's quite a it's quite a challenge isn't it when you've got a fast-paced book and you've still got to sort of educate the the reader of what's going on in the world that you may exist in oh yeah definitely and i mean that's you know that's always a struggle no matter what book you're working on to be honest at least for, mm -hmm. for me it is and you kind of for me i think you have to go with your gut like from a reader you, you have to stop for a second as a writer 
-hmm. and read it as a reader and go, what does Doug want to read when he's reading this? Is this too much? Is this too little? Uh -huh. You know, what do I need to say? What would I like to hear? Um, so it's, it's finding that balance in your gut, to be honest with you. And, and you know, that's, that can be torture. I won't lie. Like I probably did the, redid the dialogue on this entire graphic novel three times. Mm. It, ooh, three times. Yeah. I, can't, I, don't like, I don't like writing dialogue once. Never mind. You know, I always get the he said, she said, he said, she said, she said. <laughs> <laughs> that can happen. It's easy. Uh, the I'm intrigued because Pearson, and especially for for big two books, the Pearson always seems at the moment for me it seems a little bit off because the writing for graphics and the writing for trades and all that sort of stuff, and I, and I sometimes feel like there's a couple of um a couple of issues that are filler i mean before the pod talked we, 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 you mentioned one division um i feel there's as great as that show has been i feel there's been at least two two filler episodes in where pretty much nothing happens right and yeah. it's, they hit that quarter i mean for for this book for yumi what i absolutely totally enjoyed was that kind of it was patient at the start then you kind of get the gang together a little bit because of you know the car and the girl have got to meet and mm -hmm. then from there on in it's kind of room and you use the flashbacks well to kind of break up that that speed element so i, I, I basically i want to tip my hat i think you know you've got the pace and bang on right for this it there's not one part of it that i think to myself you know what i don't need i can skip this bit i don't need to read this bit you've got to read it all because that's part of the fun all right so <laughs> You'll miss something. So, I mean, how do you feel about the like the pacing elements and stuff? Do you is that kind of a, a thing, or do you just go with the story and that's it? You know, I mean, I, I kind of throw down the story and go with it, but I, I have an idea of how I want the pacing to work when I start out. So, like that's you know, and I, and I I will say like doing the indie creator book path is it makes it a little easier because I can go, hey, this one was meant to be four issues, or this one was meant to be six. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, obviously, like you said, I think sometimes when you're working on something like WandaVision or you're working on a Marvel or DC book and they're like, hey, we need six issues for every trade. Yeah. What if the story doesn't have six issues worth of story? That's where you get Jeff Johnson. Oops, I didn't say that. <laughs> you didn't say that. I didn't hear it. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Sorry. Yeah, I think, I think that's where you can bump into that kind of stuff. And you're right. I mean, I think it can hurt the story. I think it becomes a little, like you said, I think a lot of times with the way DC and Marvel are approaching some things right now, it becomes a little too repetitive and you know, yeah. hey, this is going to be a six issue story every time. Yeah. And every now and then, why don't you just throw in like a, oh, here's a one issue story about Siri, you know, yeah. like, and then let's throw something radical in there just to throw yeah. everybody off. It, it, you know, I missed, I missed the one issue stories. I, I'm a big, I've, I've been a comic book collector for, for absolute years and I've got books going back to, you know, when Raz Al Ghul and Batman fought in the desert. So, you know, that's how far my collection goes back on some books, not all of them. Um, but it, when you read back old old DC or Marvel books, you know, the, there's hardly an event. It, yeah. It's just oh, it's no. just a story. It's just like, there's a story. All right, cool. Next issue, there's a story. The event books, they're just, uh, I don't know, they're just, Ah, this is why we like independent books. That's why we like yeah. creator books. Well, and, and you know, you and I grew up reading the same things. I mean, my big one was, you know, Uncanny X-Men in the day. And what was really great about yeah. that kind of stuff was, uh, you know, Dracula was in a book, but you didn't know if he was going to be in one issue or six issues. Yeah, yeah. You know, when, when they fought the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, you didn't know if that was going to be two issues or six. You know, and it was just, that's what was part of the fun is you didn't know when it was going to end. Mm. You know? I, I've got to be honest. I don't. I don't use previews world. I said this previously on a different pod, but I don't use previews world because I think I don't want to know. I don't want. Yeah. I, I don't want to know. Yeah. I see. I get the books. I review the books. I don't want to know what happens. So I'll say to my friends, "Yeah, I can't believe such and such is happening." Like, yeah, yeah, we've known for months. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> right, what else? Yes. Yeah, I'm um, saying the trailers. You know, like I'll, I'll, I'll keep my finger on the button. So when the trailer's going, I'm like, that's all I need to know. Click. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a what? What did I watch? I think there was a movie I saw, and um, all the best bits were in the trailer. I was like, yeah. I'm done. I'm I'm done. So that's fine. Right. Whilst I take a break from my indignation of the big two, so we can get back to talk about this kick-ass Kickstarter. Why don't you listen to um, one of our adverts for one of our other shows? Um, 
I've already mentioned it. So this is a shout out to the Old Timers Comic Book Show. Do you want to find out what makes the professor do his happy dance? Check out the Old Timers Comic Book Show only on the UCPN. Oh man. <laughs> Nice soundtrack. <laughs> hey, that, that's a show, man. That's that. That's it. It's um. It's, it's a, we had it on YouTube. It's on our, on our site, the Undercover Capes Podcast Network, or the UCPN. Old timers comic book show. Does what it says on the tin. Talks about old time comic books. All right. So anything before ninety five. Wow. Anything. So we've done. They've done indie books. They've done. Um, uh, they did a Valentine's special, which was cool, because they talked about Lawson Clark, the Hawks, and then some idiot decided to start a whole Bring Back Deborah Whitman rant. <laughs> no, they, oh, that's you, man. Yeah, that was me. That was me. Nice. Hashtag Spidey's True Love. There you go. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's a good show. It's, it's, it's fun. It's lighthearted. And it's about old comic books, so you don't have to worry about anything crazy. But go check it out. And... The professor, every time he plays that music, he does his little dance. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> we had to take advantage. All right. Okay. So we've got some covers to look at. Let's have a look and see what we've got to. Um, I think we've seen a couple already, but we can talk about. This one's a really nice one. I like the Frank Miller style black and, and almost whites on there. That's quite yep. cool. Yeah, that's Hoyt Silva. That's the guy that did the interiors as well. So he did. I, I love this cover. It's amazing. I, I find it. It's just occurred to me as I'm looking at it now. Um, the scheme of this cover, the color scheme, is uh, pretty much the car's colors at times. Is it not? Oh yeah, yep. yeah. It ties in with the car because it goes from white to teal to to black at some point. So that's yep. that's that's clever. I like that. I really like that. That's a good, that, that's a good shout. Well done. I like that a lot. Uh, what else do we have? Who else? Um, let me just double check. Uh, we've seen the main one. This one looks, this one's interesting. I like this one. This one's quite almost cosplay esque. Yeah. That? Yeah. That's a, that's a Lisa Ivanova. Um, she did two covers for it. And the, yeah, this one, honestly, is probably my favorite because, you know, the foxes and the way she handled the Yumi bombs. Uh -huh. And yeah, it's just this, this covers insane. I love it. And these Yumi bombs, these occur in the book. These are, oh, yeah. these, <laughs> these are this isn't, this isn't cover hyperbole. This, these exist. You know? Yes. So, so it's cool. I've got to ask, we, we, we talked about influences and stuff. We've, we kind of talked about that a little bit, but for Yumi, she's a she's a, a ninja spy who doesn't do anything quietly. So she's no. much the anti spy, right. the anti ninja, because you know she's supposed to be stealth. But you know, mm -hmm. there you go. not when so you much. When you've got a Cardi B car, kind of um, you know, spoils you. You sneak up on someone. How did you kind of integrate all the different parts then? Because you've got, as you say, the Scott Pilgrim bit, you've got the James Bond bit. You've, how did you integrate the kind of things to make a unified whole? Honestly, it was, it came down to like Hoyt, you know, like I talked about earlier with the one upsmanship, you know, like we would talk about stuff and blowing stuff up and, you know, what we wanted in there and how fun we wanted to make the book. And it was like, okay, so. You know, we want swords, we want kunai, we want this car that can shoot lasers, um, but we want to blow more stuff up. How can we blow more stuff up? We need sticky bombs. What are our sticky bombs going to look like? You know, just like this crazy, like, honestly, we were kind of like on too much caffeine, you know, kind of like <laughs> ideas, you know, throwing them around and being like, hey, what if, what if we had a battle in a graveyard and we blew up the graveyard kind of thing? You know, like that's yeah. the kind of stuff we would come up with just off the, you know, and just throwing ideas back and forth and seeing what would stick. Okay, so I'm um, looking at the looking at your previous work, you know, uh, plastic and the ride predominantly. This book feels like a total change of pace. Now I know I know writers, you know, don't want to be pigeonholed as the Vertigo guy or the the violence guy or the sexy in love the the creepy in love with a doll kind of guy. <laughs> Yeah, go check the book out. It's fine. It works out in the end. It works out. Yeah. Um, 
So how do you kind of, I'm really interested, how do you channel that, th those different, those different types of stories? Because, you know, you, you find some writers tend to go the same route or the same route, if I'm using my American words, um, <laughs> that, that, you, that they do with the same beats. Mm -hmm. How do you manage to to move away from the si the sort of darker side that we see in Plastic and the Ride to this kind of chaotic Scott Pilgrim kind of fun, um, violent type of thing? How how does that kind of you know? I, I'm with you. I, I come up with so many different ideas, and they're all varying different genres and stuff. But I think if you look at my stuff, what my my fallback is always going to be is love. I know that sounds crazy, but mine's always oh, about love. like, yeah, it's about love, true love. What that, what does that mean? Whether it's friendship or, you know, relationships, however that might come into in like, how does somebody express that love? How far will they go to yeah. save that love is usually what my stories end up being about. If you're looking between the lines now, whether that's got a, yeah. a blow up doll in it or a car in bullets or, you know, Cardi B sentient Lamborghini, uh, the main characters kind of always fall on their heart is what you know I, I tend to fall back on now you've said that now you've said that i can absolutely totally see that especially in the ride yeah. absolutely you know i you know it, it the trappings may change the circumstances may change but at the, at the core element you've got this person that cares about someone or something right yeah yes cool totally get that totally get that do you have a do you have a favorite genre do you like writing do you prefer writing the darker tales versus the funner stuff? I, you know, and, and probably why Plastic Run so true is because I love that dark comedy kind of horror, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And the, and the one I probably haven't had a chance yet to dive into is I love sci-fi. And so I'm hoping someday I can, you know, sci-fi is a little bit tougher to pull off in comics. Um, you think? You think? Yeah, I, I think for artists it is. Um, you know, because when you're talking about like details and, you know, the ships you're going to have to design in this whole world, you have to design from scratch versus doing something in the real world um, can be challenging for them. I, I always think horror is hard to do in comics. Especially if you're talking about like the surprise kind of horror. Yeah. Like, hey, you know, something yeah. jumps out at you. Yeah, because you, for, as a medium, um, I'll, I'll be honest right now, I'm not a huge horror fan. I'll say, I'll, I'll get that out on the table now. Um, and it's mainly because um, I'm a reflective personality. So if I watch something like Paranormal Activity mm -hmm. and the scare's right at the end, it doesn't bother me. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's fine. I got dragged out of the bed backwards. That's fine. Three nights later, however, <laughs> that's when it hits me that my foot's hanging out of the bed. Right. That's it, right? Um, the jump scares never get me because the music gives it away. And right. that's why I find it's hard to do good horror in comics sometimes because you've got to, you don't have that, that suspense building up, which is why I, I like things, I suppose, um, like um, the ride because there's bad things happen in the ride. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's people driven. It's not horror driven. Right. And that, and that kind of, and that's a different sense of, oh my God, I can't believe they're going to do that. Right. And I think, I think you're right. I think that the jump scare, you know, the, what most movies I think now are either the jump scare, or the gore fests or kind of, those are really hard to pull off in comics, but I think you can still do like what I always lean back to is the psychological thrillers, you know, the more like alien. I think you could do alien as a comic, even the original yep. movie and it would work perfect. Yeah, totally. Cause there's no yeah. jump scares, you know, there's slow reveals that Ooh, scare I don't you. Oh, that egg. First yeah. time I watched First time I watched Alien, I was like, right, the eggs opening up, turn it off. <laughs> I, said, I, I said this, I told this story not so long ago to, to a different different career, but um, my, I'm a, I'm a geek, as you'd expect, uh, but I love Star Wars, my grand, bless her cotton socks. She decided to try and find out what all this, what's all this Star Wars thing he's on about? So she decided she'd watch a sci-fi movie to find out what Star Wars was like. And the one she picked was Alien. <laughs> nothing like it. Yeah, nothing like it. The farthest you can get. <laughs> it's like it's like somebody watching Taxi Driver because they want to know what the comedy taxi is about. Right. Yes. Yeah, like not even close. Yeah. That's awesome. Hashtag epic 
fail. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll talk about your Kickstarter. It's there on the screen. It is still going. At the time of recording, you've got nine days. That's pretty good going. Um, so you have got a twelve. Is it twelve thousand dollar goal? Is that right? And yeah, um, we already, yeah, we already achieved our goal, which is fantastic. Yeah, you've come. You're on fourteen two forty eight. So that's fourteen thousand two hundred and forty eight already. Uh, check out the Kickstarter page. There are a ton, a ton of um, extra things and pledge elements that you get, your stretch goals. Um, what should people be looking for in the stretch goals? Well, I mean, obviously the next one will be vinyl stickers, I believe. And that, that one I'm personally in love with because we turned Lois's cover into a die cut vinyl sticker. Right. And so, you know, it's, I think it's four inches tall, so it's going to be beautiful. See, I'm like, oh man, I, I kind of need that for myself. Like, <laughs> well, basically, you're pledging yourself, right? Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm pledging myself to make sure I get that sticker. <laughs> Good call. Slip, slap on top of your laptop. Boof, there. You yes, go. exactly. <laughs> done. Um, how does it work? Is this the first Kickstarter you've done? This is my second Kickstarter. Okay. How do you find Kickstarters? Because um, you you're an established name. You've worked. Mm -hmm. You know, you've You've worked on on with DC. You've worked on some big indie books. Um, how do you find working on a Kickstarter different then? Because I mean, I suppose the question I'll ask first of all is why go Kickstarter route? Yes. If, you, if you're a recognised name, why do you need to go Kickstarter? That's probably um, I didn't mean to me, say quite as direct as that, but you know. yeah. For me, it was about. I mean, obviously, the pan. The, be honest, the pandemic had the biggest influence on it. Um, mm -hmm. When, when the comic shops over here closed and obviously Diamond stopped shipping for a couple of months, mm -hmm. several books that I, were, that I was working on were either pushed or, or basically put on hold for indefinitely. And so that terrified me. I was like, what am I going to do if I can't work on comics? Like, I don't have any other skills. So, you know, it's like <laughs> I had to. So honestly, I like I got together with Brian and Hoyt and I was like, hey, what if we did something different? What if we tried this crowdfunding route? And um, they both said, hey, let's try something different. Um, and it's been a blast. Like it, it's so different and it's nothing like com the comic book industry. Um, but you know, there's a lot more stressors, especially for 30 days during the Kickstarters. Um, <laughs> but you get to interact a lot more with the people that are actually going to read your book. And that part of it is really intriguing and interesting to me because mm. beforehand, like you ship your book to image or dark horse or boom. And you don't really ever get a chance to interact with anybody that's, that's bought it or read it. And in this case, I'm interacting with everybody that's buying it or thinking about buying it or reading it. And that, that I love. Cause I mean, I miss, you know, obviously not going to shows anymore for a while mm. and I miss interacting with our people, you know, is the way, the way I always put it. And this has given me a chance to kind of like, Hey, this is kind of like a mini con for me for 30 days. Like I get to, you know, email and text and Facebook message with people who enjoy my work and it's fantastic. I love it. Okay, cool. Excellent. So I, I hear that and I absolutely totally agree with you. My local comic book shop in the UK, we've been in a national lockdown since Christmas. So it was due to shops, non-essential shops are due to open on April the 12th. So I've got from Christmas to April. To Ooh, oh man, that's going to be, you're going to have to rent a truck. <laughs> I still have books from the first lockdown that I haven't read. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm like, this is killing me. It's killing me. So yeah, um, uh, conventions. I'm going to say. I'm going to see if uh, you're a little bit interested in this. We've been known to throw on a virtual convention or two. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The virtual cons. Um, I'll send you some information about it um, off air. Um, but we are due to have one in April. So. I'm trying to pull together a panel of indie writers and artists. If you're interested, oh, definitely interested. Like yeah. I said, I'm, I am, I am so hungry for cons. Like, yeah. dude, I'm. You can count me in. Like, it's 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 a no-brainer. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Cool. That's good. I'll I, I pencil you in on that one. That's cool. Um, we talked about we talked about how, and of course, your fantastic skills as the writer of this book. It's time to give out some shout outs. Colorist for this is. Kevin Linneritz. Yep. Kevin Linneritz, incredible, super nice guy. Um, he and Hoyt had worked together for a while and uh, Hoyt threw him the book and said, hey, do what you want to do on this and let's see what happened. And it turned out fantastic. So for me, you mentioned Malibu earlier. 
I think probably the biggest improvement in comics over the last 20, 30 years has been the coloring process. Oh, yeah, hands down. Yeah, cool. Yeah, this totally book, agree. This book has kind of like a digital feel to it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, totally done digitally, yeah. Yeah, cool. And that kind of neon sort of vibrantness, I suppose. There's no sort of, I don't want to say nuance, that, that's too harsh, but or texture, but it's very much loud and boom there it is which which fits the vibe of the book of course yeah, that's, that's what i was about to say yeah it fits, it fits yumi's character you know yeah, totally and um of course that means that frank i'm going to say that wrong Vekovic. there you go see yep. thank you <laughs> <laughs> dodge day bullet all right okay uh letter Oh yeah, Letter, he's another incredible guy to work with. Um, you can tell just by looking at the book, especially when we went, hey, we're going to put music notes in panels. How are you going to work that out, Frank? Yeah. Um, <laughs> he, 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 he earned every penny we paid him. And, you know, like I told you, like I lettered the, we had the book re-lettered three times. So, you know, that was a, a lot of work for Frank, but he, uh, he was a champ the whole time. He was wonderful to work with. And, uh, he, you know, Every now and then he'd get a little gruff, you know, and be like, oh, I don't want to know if I don't want to change this again. And I'm like, I'm sorry, dude. Like, I'll, I'll pay you. <laughs> I was like, what's it going to take? He's going to charge you, charge you yeah. 10 cents a letter or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Frank was fantastic. And, and he, what he did with the musical notes and stuff and how he made them flow throughout this, the pages was brilliant. He's just a genius at what he does. Um, excellent. So I'll, I'm a, a big uh, fan of giving letters credits because um, – Generally, I got I, honestly, I got called out. Uh, Tyler Esposito put on Twitter about age about three years ago, I think, something now about how letters weren't getting recognition. I was like, you know what? I actually don't. So I changed my whole perception. I was like, right, letters get some love. Yes. So, so and, and way overdue. And if you'll notice, like, I think on all my indie books, I make sure the letter is on the cover as well because it's, um, they are. I mean, I won't lie from a writer's perspective. Mm -hmm. um they save me a lot of times and uh you know when you're putting too much dialogue in a panel or something like that they can still make it look good and mm -hmm. nobody notices really when a letterer does a great job but you can tell when a letterer doesn't like you know so it's it like a referee in football it's like a referee yeah. in football you know you, you can know. tell when the refs are getting a little bit uppity when they're throwing flags but for like the shirt is untucked but exactly so, but a good referee just lets the game flow, you know, because mm -hmm. secret to the NFL, there's holding on every player. Oh, yeah, every play. On, yeah, both teams are, are doing it on both sides of the ball, yeah, so, every play. Yeah, so <laughs> anyone who thinks otherwise, you're a baseball fan. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you what, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing them out today. I, I'm getting, I'm losing fans left, right, and center for this. Okay. <laughs> All right, okay, so the book is fully funded. If you pledge money now, you are guaranteed the book. Um, is it um, digital as well as uh, physical? Yes, you can do it. There's a PDF. If you're just looking for a quick read on, on digital, you can get the PDF. Um, the great news about this is, you know, like we talked about earlier, I wouldn't even have considered doing this Kickstarter if the book wasn't done. So the book's done. There's no risk of us not finishing it. Um, I I've read the book. Yeah, you've read the book, so you know. <laughs> I, I've read yeah. that. And you know what? It's such a fun read. It is absolutely. It's the first the first issue, the first part, the first act, whatever you want to call it, is such a great scene setter. And the mic drop when she gets the car, you're just like, where are we going from this? And yeah. from that's exactly the feeling that every in every segue that's exactly the feeling you have yeah even thank you. Even, yeah. even right up to the last page you're still like um although i have to say i did notice that uh um richard's surname made me laugh but i'm not giving i'm not giving the joke away but it made me laugh yeah <laughs> so i'm like that's that's my type that's my type of humor I got it. Yeah, we're <laughs> good. We're on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> oh, next, next, the next time up, the villain's going to be what debug or something. I don't know. <laughs> and I, I, that's my copyright as well. So remember, no helicopters in buildings. Okay, no helicopters, no debugs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, all 
Cool. So you've worked you've worked on um, some big two characters. Um, okay, so I suppose this is my final question. I always ask everybody, and it's not because I think independent books um, don't have their grace. I love independent books. Comic Crusaders was founded by reviewing and promoting indie books. That's why we have Flipside Focus that talks about indie books. Yeah. However, if one of the big two came calling and said, Doug, we need you to write a book. Which character would it be would, that you would go for? DC, I desperately want Lobo. What? <laughs> yeah, I want Lobo. I want, you know, I feel like I could take him and do something along that, like exactly what you're thinking, like the plastic ride spin uh, I, and I, have I, it just be total chaos with a little <laughs> bit of serial killer in there. Like, it just worries me that he loves his dolphins a little bit too much. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's in Crossed. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And for Marvel? Uh, for Marvel, I, always is going to, you know, X Men is my, you know, that, that book changed me as a kid. Yeah. And, you know, if I ever got a chance to even write one issue of X Men, that would be like a dream come true of like, because Chris Claremont is hands down my biggest. Uh, inspiration and so yeah if i even got a chance just to write a short story of x-men i would that would blow me away i've interviewed chris a couple of years yeah. a couple of years back I interviewed him uh we did a whole massive uh, it was like an ensemble piece um i remember chris claremont from miss marvel yes <laughs> yeah which i love so mm -hmm. um you know so uh, as well as of course his x-men stuff which is your you've mentioned x-men so i've got to ask which is your which is your x-men um era is it chris, obviously chris claremont with oh yeah chris claremont Jim, john byrne um oh man who did the brood saga is that dave Stock, dave cockram dave cockram um both of those were i mean john byrne's run on that is almost flawless yeah i've been trying to get my wife to read the De dark phoenix saga yes she's, she's not there yet i'm like read the book <laughs> dark phoenix can i not uh, just watch the, the film mutants. Yeah, no, you cannot. Uh, do not watch the movie. No, no, don't waste your time. Yeah, it's not. It's not anywhere near as good as the I, comic was. And so for me, um, I like some of the. I, I love the John Byrne stuff. Totally get it. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have a soft spot for the Mark Silvestri stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't go. I mean, Mark Silvestri is amazing. Like everything he puts on paper is amazing. Yeah, I. Uh, that, that's that's probably. I liked it because it was. Up to that point, it was all the same. It was all in the mansion, in the danger room. Oh, look, they're in the danger room. Oh, look, they're in the mansion. When these get kicked out to Australia, things got a little bit different. I was like, oh, okay, see how that goes. And of course, the Siege Perilous comes in and everything else changes after that. So, no, it's funny, you know, said Jim Lee. Although, you know, there, was, there was a good time period there. We had like Larry Stroman on a book and Mark yeah. Silvestri. And, and he, I loved it back when there was like, you can, you can tell just by the the artist, the flavor of the book, and that they were all different. I love that back in that era. I loved, um, I loved the Simmons and X Factor. Oh yeah, uh, that, so that was that was the uh, kickass for me. Right there you go. So the Kickstarter is still live. Go pledge, get some uh, extra goodies going. You get the book, it's your choice, PDF or hard hardback or softback. You can pitch with whichever. It's cool. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> get both. Get all three. <laughs> Who knows? Help Doug get his sticker. That's yeah, help, my, help me get my sticker. And, you know, obviously, you know, I, I just want to get the book out and people to read it and hopefully they enjoy it. That's always the main key. Well, um, I've, got to, I've got to say the book is a blast from page one onwards. You know, it's, yeah. it, was, um, it was a total change of pace from your previous stuff. Um, yes. So I, it took me by surprise. I'm not going to yeah. lie. I was like, whoa, what's going on? Uh, but when I got there, it was great. It's fun. It's energetic. It's pacey. The artworks, um, lots of different little nuances in there that show that, you know, the modern world that we're living in. Um, so absolutely, I've got to, you know, if I was wearing a hat, I would tip it. Well done, sir. <laughs> Thank well you. Done. <laughs> Right, there you go. That's the end of this episode of Outside the Panels. 
do not forget to check out the UCPN for all your favorite shows, including the Professor Dancing All Timers Comic Book Show, uh, the Definitive Crusade, Flipside Focus, where we talk everything about indie books, and the No Prize Podcast. All right, take a guess at what that one's about. <laughs> Maybe more. There is, <laughs> there is, there is a special live screening of One Division, the finale prime this week so check your twitters go look for it get yourselves watching that as we watch one division all right excellent so doug thanks very much oh it's my uh, pleasure thank you so much for having me on johnny it means a lot more, yeah you're more than welcome thank you for such a great book um so guys this is johnny machine hughes saying adios